Hello, welcome. Welcome to this course on statistical mechanics. My name is Girish Setlur. I am professor of physics at Indian Institute of Technology, Gauhati. It is my great pleasure to uh, share with you the contents of this course, which is going to teach you the basics of statistical mechanics at the postgraduate level uh, based on Indian syllabus. So, uh, let us get on with it shall we. So, the prerequisites for this course are uh, you should have had a course in advanced calculus that includes uh, multivariable integrations for instance. Uh, so, you should be able to perform calculations with Stokes theorem and Gauss theorem you know with specific examples involving cylinders and spheres and that sort of thing. And then it is really helpful to know a little bit of complex variables such as uh, you know applications of the residue theorem and it is really also helpful to know the method of steepest descent uh, or sometimes it is called the saddle point method of integrations. And um, the other topic that is helpful to know beforehand is combinatorics. Uh, so, in other words uh, you know how to count uh, permutations, combinations. Well, I am going to teach a lot of that myself in this course but it is really nice to know that some of that beforehand. The other uh, skill that I expect uh, uh, some of you to have uh, it is really desirable to have this at least is uh, basic knowledge of programming in some language. I am not going to insist on which language, but that is uh, up to you. So, uh, the other uh, important prerequisite is that you should have some understanding of classical mechanics uh, say at the level of Goldstein. So, you do not have to know everything, but you should know uh, suppose I uh, say Hamiltonian you should know what I am talking about and so on and so forth. So, phase space and so on. So, the other thing that is really helpful to know is um, quantum mechanics at the level of Griffiths for example. So, you should be able to solve simple problems uh, find the eigenfunctions of particle in a box a harmonic oscillator and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, above all uh, what is really important is uh, for you to have a desire uh, to learn this important subject and a willingness uh, to uh, remedy gaps in your prerequisites if you feel that there are gaps uh, that have to be filled. Okay, so, let us get on with the course itself, but before I get into the technical aspects I feel that it is really nice to know some historical context. Because uh, many times what happens is that uh, when physics is taught far too often uh, both teacher and student directly jump headlong into the technical aspects without uh, pausing to think about why these notions are important or trying to place them in a historical context and ask themselves what is it that led to these concepts to uh, be studied in the first place. So, history is important also because uh, if later on some of you feel that you are going to be able to contribute to the subject. Uh, you should have a understanding of uh, why a certain idea uh, took root at a certain time in history and why it was abandoned later on and something better took its place. So, history is important for that reason. So, let us uh, find out uh, what was the historical precedence which led to the development of uh, modern statistical mechanics. So, uh, as you very well know that the subject of thermodynamics was the conceptual uh, precursor or predecessor of statistical mechanics. So, uh, from antiquity up to 1600 uh, the uh, notions of heat and temperature uh, were quite familiar to many thinkers. So, they kind of had a rough feel about what they were talking about. So, it was for instance believed at that time that heat was associated with the motion of microscopic constituents of matter. That was remarkable since uh, uh, you know at that time there was no, uh, no discoveries were made about atoms people did not know that uh, matter is made of subatomic particles called atoms and so on. And yet uh, people correctly surmised that uh, heat was associated with the motion of subatomic constituents of matter. However, unfortunately later on the idea the wrong idea that uh, heat 
was some kind of a fluid in motion for some reason uh, became popular. So, you see this is an example of uh, history kind of uh, going in the wrong direction, the subject uh, takes a wrong turn and then finally, it comes back to the right turn when experiments decide which is the correct point of view. So, um, so for instance, the experiments performed by James Joule uh, in 1850 uh, showed that heat is actually a form of energy. So, later on uh, Sadi Carnot had explained the relation between heat and energy in his uh, famous treatises and uh, this was important in the development of uh, steam engines uh, during the uh, industrial revolution. In 1850, uh, Rudolf Clausius and uh, William Thomson uh, also known as Lord Kelvin, uh, they formulated uh, the first law of thermodynamics which you all know as basically stating that uh, you know heat is converted to you know either it gets converted to either internal energy or work is done. So, it is a ex statement of uh, sort of conservation of energy, it just tells you one form of energy gets converted to other forms of energy that you cannot really destroy or create energy out of nothing. So, uh, however, the uh, that is fairly obvious, but the less obvious second law of thermodynamics which is the idea that you cannot convert heat completely to work uh, in the absence of any other process uh, was formulated. So, that is less obvious because uh, first law of thermodynamics does not forbid heat from being completely converted to work. So, but second law of thermodynamics forbids that. Uh, so, uh, in 1738 uh, Daniel Bernoulli pointed out uh, that uh, gases actually consist of molecules in motion. So, you can see that uh, these ideas kept on being reinvented independently by, by various thinkers. So, from antiquity people guessed correctly then in between people forgot about it that uh, you know atoms are the basic constituents of matter and heat is manifests itself because of motion of molecules. So, basically heat is just a manifestation of the kinetic motion of molecules uh, that was an idea that uh, was repeatedly rediscovered uh, throughout history by various thinkers. So, Clausius again revived this idea in 1857 and in 1860 uh, James Clerk Maxwell of the electrodynamics fame. So, we all know about Maxwell's uh, equations of electromagnetism, but also uh, Maxwell uh, made a important contribution to uh, statistical mechanics, because he used uh, the idea of Clausius and his predecessors to uh, derive the expected distribution of molecular speeds in a gas by taking into account molecular collisions. So, he, he derived what is now known as the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of a classical gas. Okay, uh, so, in 1872, uh, another towering figure of the subject uh, Ludwig Boltzmann constructed an equation that he thought could describe the detailed time evolution of a gas regardless of whether it is in equilibrium or not. So, in other words uh, he thought uh, he had an equation when solved uh, explicitly explains how you know a gas that is starts off in a certain state evolves and uh, eventually uh, the idea was that it is going to thermalize. In other words, the final uh, state of a gas is that of a thermal equilibrium described by Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Boltzmann thought that his equation will finally, uh, not only will he be able to derive uh, Maxwell's uh, contribution to the subject namely the molecular, uh, the distribution of molecular speeds, but Boltzmann also thought that his equation will be able to explain how that final equilibrium state is reached uh, starting from any arbitrary initial state. So, in, in the 1860s Clausius had introduced the notion of entropy as the ratio of uh, heat uh, going into a system and its absolute temperature. And he had stated the uh, second law of thermodynamics in terms of an increase of this quantity with time. So, Clausius had stated his uh, second law of thermodynamics in terms of uh, heat and temperature. So, uh, Boltzmann showed that uh, uh, his equation uh, also could uh, account for something analogous namely that he showed that 
there is a quantity called h in his equations which also increases with time which he also identified with entropy. But then later on his ideas uh, Boltzmann's ideas were criticized by his compatriots and uh, by his contemporaries rather. And uh, the main source of criticism was that uh, Boltzmann's equation could be run in reverse and then it would uh, show that entropy is actually decreasing in time because Boltzmann equation was based on the laws of classical mechanics which are actually you know time reversal in invariant. So, uh, you whatever process in classical mechanics that can go forward in time can equally well go backward in time. But uh, later, much later it was realized that Boltzmann had made a hidden assumption namely that uh, he had uh, assumed implicitly that when collisions occur the speeds of the molecules are uncorrelated before collision and but then they become correlated after collision because they obey you know the conservation of energy momentum that sort of thing. So, uh, because, uh, because of this uh, Boltzmann unwittingly had introduced irreversibility in his equations uh, and uh, as a result his equations predicted that entropy increases with time. So, so in effect uh, he was basically uh, assuming whatever he was trying to prove. And uh, finally, in the 1900s another scientist named Gibbs introduced the notion of an ensemble. So, the idea of an ensemble was that it is a collection of states of a system such that you are able to assign the that the probability of each of those uh, states occurring. So, that you identify set of closely related states and you call that as one, one kind of an entity and then you keep, keep dividing all the possible states or classify reclassify all the states of the system. Uh, into these uh, ensembles. So, this is also called coarse graining. So, you assign probabilities to each each of these cluster of states and uh, what Gibbs showed that it is possible through this coarse graining to also show why entropy should increase with time. So, he showed that uh, the, the second law of thermodynamics uh, which states that entropy is non decreasing function of time for isolated systems is simply a reflection of our uh, unwillingness or inability to precisely pin down all the microstates. So, we, we tend to lump all different microstates into the same category and that uh, fuzziness is what causes the second law of thermodynamics. So, I, I realize that uh, my explanations uh, will probably not satisfy any of you because it is rather vague because I have used words and sentences to describe it. But uh, you will have to bear with me because in the next couple of slides and lectures I will be very precisely and quantitatively pinning down what I was talking about. Okay, so, uh, before I get into the actual nitty gritty of the subject it is worthwhile to flash this uh, nice photograph in front of you and this is uh, the photo of none other than Mr. Boltzmann himself and you can see that he lived between 1844 and 1906 and uh, he, he was a philosopher and a physicist and he was uh, instrumental in the development of statistical mechanics. And uh, he also uh, showed how uh, the, these ideas could be used to determine uh, various properties of substances such as viscosity, thermal conductivity, diffusion and so on. Okay, uh, so, now let us get to the actual subject. So, instead of uh, starting with statistical mechanics I start with its intellectual predecessor just to remind you of uh, some of the prerequisites as it were and namely the zeroth law, first law and second law of thermodynamics. So, uh, zeroth law is very simple it says that um, if uh, two systems A and B are in equilibrium with a third system C then A and B are also equilibrium with one another. So, this is a fairly obvious statement and an intuitive one, but it is worth stating because uh, if we do not have this uh, stated explicitly we would not be able to use it later. So, um, but then keep in mind that I uh, used uh, a term called equilibrium without defining it. And um, so, this is a uh, unfortunately a common occurrence in physics 
many times physicists uh, use terms without properly defining what they are. Uh, that is uh, unlike in uh, other subjects like mathematics where uh, you know its practitioners are very careful in defining what they are talking about. So, there are many reasons for this uh, in physics and partly it is uh, historical and uh, uh, kind of uh, training that kind of does not put proper emphasis on uh, precision in uh, use of proper terminology. And the other reason I feel is also because uh, unlike mathematics which is a purely intellectual activity, physics is about understanding nature and the concepts of nature are necessarily uh, vague because they when they first present themselves they do not present themselves as very concrete mathematical notions. So, it is a big struggle for a physicist to start with a notion uh, which comes from nature and try to make it very precise. So, as it happens that many of these uh, notions uh, continue to be vague for a uh, great period of time. So, however, I will make uh, I will put in enough effort to make sure that I am able to define these notions as precisely as I can whenever it is possible. Okay, so, uh, I spoke of systems in equilibrium. So, let me define what that is. So, a system is said to be in equilibrium if its macro properties do not change appreciably with time. So, uh, so in other words if properties that you can measure of that system do not change with time uh, appreciably then obviously you say that system is in equilibrium that is fairly obvious and it is intuitive. So, uh, but then you know if you have a macroscopic systems what are the sort of properties I am talking about. Uh, so, there are many properties that a macroscopic system can possess. For example, it could um, I could be talking about pressure, volume if it is a gas I could be talking of pressure, volume and uh, or if it is a wire I am talking about the thermal expansion of a wire, it could be the tension applied to the wire, it could be the length of the wire and so on. Or if it is a dielectric, I could be talking about the applied electric field, I could be talking about the induced polarization and so on. So, if all these uh, quantities do not change with time, then um, I say the system is in equilibrium. So, let me define what I am talking about here with respect to the first law. So, the, what is the first law? So, there's, there are several ways of stating the first law of thermodynamics. So, one way of stating the first law of thermodynamics is to say that the work required to change the state of an isolated system depends only on the initial and final states and not on the intermediate states through which the system passes. So, let me repeat that that is a lot of uh, words to swallow. So, uh, the first law of thermodynamics states that the work required to change the state of an isolated system depends only on the initial and final states and not on the intermediate states through which the system passes. So, what does that mean? So, it basically uh, this should ring a bell because in uh, classical mechanics we all encounter what is known as a conservative force. So, if you if you are thinking about uh, say work done due to a conservative force then you know that that uh, the work done is basically just the change in the potential energy between the initial and final state and it does not depend upon the intermediate positions or speeds or whatever it is that the system or the particle passes through. So, it simply depends upon the initial and final state and that is the change in potential energy. So, it is similar here. So, the work required to change the state of the system if it only depends on the initial final states just like it uh, should remind you of a conservative system in classical mechanics. So, that is precisely the first law. So, it says that if it is an isolated system that is what happens. So, the work required does not depend on the intermediate states. So, that is the first law. So, it seems like a very unusual way of stating the first law, but we will come back to how this you know is consistent with some other formulation of first law that you may be more familiar with. So, there is another terminology that I have to uh, introduce and explain and that is called adiabatic. So, the above process that I am talking about where uh, 
uh, there is an isolated system. So, by isolated means uh, no heat flows in or out of the system and no mass enters or exits the system. So, it kind of there is a hard boundary and uh, the only thing that you can do is do work, but you cannot really push and or extract energy from it in any other way. So, in that case, uh, so if the only thing you can do is do work on it, so then that is called adiabatic. So, if when the process is adiabatic, then the, the work required to change the state of the system does not depend on the intermediate states. Okay, so, that is the first law of thermodynamics. So, what about the second law of thermodynamics? So, the second law of thermodynamics, uh, there are two equivalent statements uh, which describes the second law of thermodynamics. So, I will prove the equivalence subsequently. So, Clausius uh, stated the second law of thermodynamics in the following way. So, he said that no process is possible whose uh, sole result is the transfer of heat from a colder to a hotter body. So, you can see that this is a very intuitive uh, formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. So, we have experienced this uh, a lot in our daily life. So, if you have a cold object and a hot object, if you put them say in contact with each other, uh, its heat always flows from the hotter object to the colder object and then they become equally warm or whatever at the end. But it never happens that the colder object spontaneously becomes even colder and transfers all its he heat whatever little heat it had to the hotter object and the hotter object becomes even hotter. So, that, that of course, does not happen spontaneously. So, if it did then it would uh, mean that you can uh, you know run your refrigerator without any electricity because after all that is what a refrigerator is. It takes uh, heat from a cold or object uh, inside the refrigerator and uh, throws it out of the refrigerator thereby cooling your vegetables or whatever it is in the fridge uh, even low uh, to a lower temperature. So, if you could do that uh, spontaneously without supplying any electricity to your refrigerator that would be a great thing, but unfortunately that, uh, that violates Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So, that is in violation of second law of thermodynamics. So, that is the reason why uh, that is not possible. Okay, so, the other statement the other uh, version of the second law of thermodynamics is due to Kelvin and he said that no process is possible uh, which involves converting heat completely into work. So, it is not possible to convert heat completely into work. So, notice that this, uh, this idea of converting heat to work even if it were possible uh, to do fully that is if you could completely convert all the heat to work, it would not violate the first law of thermodynamics. So, you can still conserve energy and still convert all the heat to work, but however, converting all the heat to work does violate the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, uh, these two versions of the second law of thermodynamics uh, seem to be very different from each other. So, let me try and convince you that they are equivalent. So, the way to convince you that the, they are equivalent is to examine these two uh, setups. So, first let us focus on the left setup here. So, I am talking about a situation where uh, you have a hot object and a cold object and um, so I uh, put these hot and cold objects in touch with uh, what are called engines. So, I have an engine here called E 1, where this engine takes heat uh, from a hot object and completely converts it to work. So, notice the black arrows there is solid black arrows here. So, this solid black arrow says that uh, heat is going in from the hot object and it is exiting uh, as work from this engine. So, this engine is uh, one of those illegal engines which violates Kelvin's statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So, notice that what does Kelvin uh, say? Kelvin states that no process is possible which involves converting completely heat into work. So, you cannot convert heat completely into work. However, this engine does exactly that. So, I have assumed that let there be an engine that violates 
Kelvin statement of the second law of thermodynamics. So, in which case there is an engine we let us assume which uh, converts heat completely into work. So, what I want to convince you is that violation of the second law of uh, thermodynamics according to Kelvin means violation of the Clausius statement of second law of thermodynamics. So, if you violate the Kelvin statement you also end up violating Clausius statement. So, in the next example I will show you that if you violate Clausius statement conversely you also is the same as violating Kelvin statement. So, now let us uh, focus on proving the first idea that is violating Kelvin statement is the same as violating Clausius statements. So, now I have uh, started with an engine that violates Kelvin statement because this engine takes heat uh, from a hot object and converts it completely to work. Now, I can use this work you see and uh, use it to run a second engine where this is a legitimate engine this is an illegal the first E 1 is an illegal engine this is E 2 is a legal engine. So, the E 2 engine exists in nature. So, because what it does is uh, it just takes work. So, think of it as maybe your AC mains. Uh, so, you are supplying some electricity and you are taking energy from a cold object and dumping it into a hot object. It is like a refrigerator it is a refrigerator. So, it is like uh, you are taking heat from your vegetables here and this is W is your this is your refrigerator in your home and you are supplying electricity called W and you are running this refrigerator and this refrigerator is taking heat from the cold vegetables and throwing it outside the refrigerator into the hot background. So, thereby cooling the uh, vegetables even further. So, put together so now I want to ask myself what is the combined effect of both these engines. So, in order to examine that I have uh, drawn these dotted lines here perhaps you can see it. So, there is this huge rectangle here that uh, encloses both these engines and you see uh, if you look at the boundary of this rectangle. So, let us ask ourselves what is the effect of both these engines put together. So, so, if you focus on this big rectangle dotted rectangle you can see that heat actually enters this big rectangle uh, from here and then it also exits from here. But then if you focus on the bottom part you see that heat exits the cold object and enters the rectangle. But then uh, finally, therefore, in order to be consistent with the first law of thermodynamics that heat should actually exit and enter the hot object. So, heat cannot be destroyed. So, you see uh, there is nothing happening to the cold object except that the only one thing is happening and that is heat is escaping from the cold object and entering this rectangle. So, after it enters the rectangle it gets dumped into the hot object. So, that is all that is happening as far as the rectangle is concerned this work that is happening is internal to inside the rectangle. So, I am not worried about what is happening inside the rectangle think of this rectangle as a black box. So, in which case if you think of this as a black box. So, heat from a cold object is entering this black box and then getting finally dumped into the hot object. So, this is a violation of the Clausius statement of the second law. So, which says that uh, no process is possible whose sole result is the transfer of heat from a colder to hotter object. So, put together that is what is happening. So, we started with an uh, illegal engine that violated Kelvin's uh, form of second law of thermodynamics, but then we also coupled it with a normal engine and together we are able to show that that means we are also violating the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics because put together it involves uh, it implies taking uh, heat from a cold object and dumping it into hot object. So, we can do the reverse and we can uh, prove that uh, the violation of the Clausius statement means the violation of Kelvin statement. So, how do you prove that as usual we start with an illegal engine E 1. Now, what does the illegal engine E 1 do? It violates the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics and what is the Clausius statement? So, it says uh, you cannot um, transfer heat from a colder to a hotter object spontaneously. So, that that is what I am going to do. I am going to assume let there be an engine called E 1 which does exactly that it takes heat from a colder object and transmits to a hotter object and no work is being done, no, no energy is being supplied for this. So, it is like a refrigerator that runs uh, 
even if the mains are switched off. So, this is an illegal engine that does not exist in nature. So, now imagine I am able to do this in which case I take heat from a cold object and dump it in a hot object. Notice that this does not violate the first law of thermodynamics because energy is conserved. Uh, I mean whatever energy was here is finally, finding its way there. So, it does not violate the first law of thermodynamics, but it violates the Clausius statement of the second law. So, now I have uh, taken heat from cold object and dumped it into the hot object spontaneously. Now, let me use some of that heat that I have now uh, dumped into the hot object to run another engine, a normal engine now and this normal engine takes heat from a hot object and some of it gets converted to work and some of it gets dumped into the colder object. So, now put together as usual I am going to draw a dotted line here. So, if I draw a dotted line and you see the all the arrows uh, that going in and out of the cold object are inside that black box which is the rectangular dotted line. So, if I ask myself what are the arrows coming out and going into that rectangular dotted line you see that there is only one arrow that is coming out and that is work that is coming out. So, if work is being done you can see that heat is being supplied and obviously, heat is being supplied because otherwise it would violate the first law. So, heat is being supplied and it is getting completely converted to work. So, no heat is now being dumped uh, into the cold uh, reservoir. So, because what is being dumped it is internal to this black box. So, if you look at it as an overall system as a black box. So, no heat is actually being dumped into the cold reservoir. So, as far as this black box is, is concerned. So, it is as if heat is being converted completely to work as a result of one illegal engine and one legal engine. So, as a result we are able to convince ourselves that a violation of the Clausius statement of the second law of thermodynamics means that we are also violating the Kelvin statement. So, so this proves the equivalence of the Kelvin and Clausius form of the second law of thermodynamics. So, now uh, let me uh, also try to describe what I mean by some of the other uh, terms that I may have uh, thrown about and those are called macro states and micro states and these terms I am going to use frequently. So, it is better to uh, you know pin them down as best as I can because later on you might be confused. Okay. Uh, so, a thermodynamic system you see is not some abstract mathematical construct, but it is an, a concrete physical system such as a gas, solid, liquid, ferromagnet. Because this is not the impression you get if you pick up any textbook on statistical mechanics you will see that it is full of equations and you get the idea that it is all mathematics, but we are actually describing a physical system here. So, uh, every thermodynamic system is made of subatomic constituents that participate in the dynamics and dictate the behavior of the bulk system. Now, uh, so what is statistical mechanics? It is an attempt to link the dynamics of the microscopic constituents of matter to the behavior of the bulk system through a function known as entropy. So, this is a preamble. Uh, it is important for me to say all this because you will see how this uh, gets linked to what I am going to say next which is about macro states and micro states. Now, entropy is actually a function of what is known as the macro state of the system. So, a macro state is really a collection of variables that uh, describe the bulk of the system such as total internal energy, volume and number of particles if we are talking about a gas for example. So, it could also describe related concepts which we are going to encounter later such as temperature, pressure and chemical potential. So, basically entropy is a function of the macro state of the system. So, macro state is something where you do not really worry about the uh, what the system is made of at the microscopic level. So, you are just uh, describing the system in terms of the overall properties such as total internal energy, volume etcetera. So, uh, by contrast uh, a micro state is actually uh, a huge collection of variables that describes the nitty gritty of the microscopic constituents of that substance. So, it is actually a uh, micro state actually keeps track of the uh, precise description of the subatomic constituents of the uh, system that you are looking at. So, it so it obviously sensitively depends upon 
uh, whether those microscopic constituents obey quantum mechanics or if they obey classical mechanics. So, as a result you will get statistical mechanics of quantum systems and classical systems. So, however, the macro states in both cases continue to be the same namely total internal energy, uh, volume, pressure, temperature and so on. But then the results for your thermodynamic quantity or later on we will see equation of state that sensitively depends upon what the basic fundamental laws governing the microscope microscopic constituents are. So, that is called the micro state. So, micro state uh, pays careful attention to the fundamental laws governing the subatomic constituents and uh, a micro state is basically a collection of variables that describes in precise detail what are those microscopic constituents doing at any given time. Okay, so, let me get to this notion in this important notion of entropy. So, according to a Boltzmann uh, one of the founding fathers of this subject uh, entropy is nothing but the logarithm of the number of micro states of a thermodynamic system which corresponds to a given macro state. So, let me explain what that means. So, the idea is that if you have a thermodynamic system and somebody tells you that it is in a given macro state term, namely the it has a total internal energy which is fixed and total number of particles which is fixed and say it has a volume that is fixed. So, obviously, I am thinking of a gas. So, now I have to ask myself what are the number of ways in which I can rearrange the subatomic constituents of this system of this gas in such a way that my total in internal energy does not change and volume does not change, number of particles does not change and yet the states that I am going to get as a result of this rearrangement are all different. So, so if I am able to count how many such rearrangements are possible and I take the logarithm of that that really corresponds to according to Boltzmann the entropy of the system. So, that is defined to be the entropy of the system. So, uh, let me give you some concrete example from everyday uh, experiences. So, not related to physics per se, but from ex uh, it also applies to everyday mundane examples like I am going to give you right now. So, for example, we could uh, think of a hand of n playing cards. So, imagine you have a standard deck of playing cards on your desk and you select n playing cards and from that n playing cards you are also know that you have selected uh, n 1 black cards which is basically spades and clubs and uh, the remaining n minus n 1 are clearly uh, the uh, red playing cards. So, the, I mean in a standard deck you only have either red cards or black cards. So, you either have spades and clubs or hearts and diamonds. So, imagine that you have n 1 black cards and n minus n 1 red cards. So, now these two numbers are examples of macro states n and n 1. These are two parameters that describe your macro state of the system. Now, what is the micro state? The micro state is the precise uh, which particular set of cards you have in your hand that would describe a micro state. For example, you can have uh, you know 2 of spades, 3 of clubs, uh, 4 of diamonds, ace of hearts. So, all these uh, this particular set of cards would describe a micro state. So, the idea that you have n 1 black cards and uh, n minus n 1 red cards is actually a macro state. Now, if you are able to fix the macro state namely you fix n 1 and you fix n minus n 1. So, you are able to fix. So, you have decided to fix the total number of black cards you have in your hand and the total number of uh, red cards you have in your hand. And then you ask how many ways I can rearrange my hand so that that is still maintained and the number you get is basically according to Boltzmann related to entropy. So, the logarithm of that number is according to Boltzmann the entropy of the system. So, the other example that I can give you is a staircase say with m steps and n equally heavy people standing on it. So, let us assume for simplicity. I have n equally heavy people standing on uh, m steps a staircase made of m steps and a macro state. So, this would correspond to a macro state. So, as macro state is described by these two numbers capital M and capital N, but then there is another parameter 
that I am going to fix uh, which also belongs to the macro state and that is the total energy u. So, I am going to say that I also uh, demand I also restrict that the total energy of the, all the people standing on that staircase should be u. So, notice that uh, a person when is standing on the first step will have say some energy so let us call it 1. So, one person standing on step number 1 will have energy 1. So, if the same person climbs to step number 2 uh, that person will have energy 2. So, if two people are standing on step 1 they will have energy 2. So, if one person is standing on step 1 and one person is standing on step 2. So, the they will have the combined system has energy 3 and so on. So, now uh, what I uh, restrict is that that if I have n, n, n people and I want to make sure that the total energy of all those people is u, it is fixed to be u. Now, with, with all these restrictions, so there are three restrictions, one is the number of steps is fixed to be capital M, the number of people are fixed to be capital N and the total energy of all the people standing on the staircase is fixed to be capital U. Now, with these three restrictions I can ask myself how many ways can I rearrange my the people standing on the staircase you know I can persuade the person who is standing on top to come to the bottom maybe the second the person who is standing on step number 2 I can ask that person to go to step number 3 and so on. So, I have to rearrange their positions in such a way that I maintain their energy to be uh, total energy to be u. So, uh, then I count how many ways in which I can do this, how many ways in which I can rearrange all these people. So, that the total energy is u and then I take the logarithm of this number and that is according to Boltzmann the entropy of the system. So, uh, notice that I spoke of people and uh, human beings are all in different individuals. So, they are all equally heavy I have assumed, but uh, one person can be wearing a red shirt, one person can be uh, Aditya, the other, other person can be Savitri. So, they can be different, they are all different people, maybe they are all equally heavy, but they are all different people. But now, uh, so you get an answer if they are all different people, you get a certain result for the entropy because there is the rearrangements, uh, you know, take into account the fact that they are all different. But instead of people, I can imagine distributing marbles on the staircase. So, imagine that they are equally heavy identical marbles uh, on the staircase. So, in which in, in this example I am not going to distinguish between the marbles they are absolutely identical. Now, I can ask the same question how many ways are there of distributing the marbles on the staircase. So, you will see that uh, the, uh, the answer is going to be different from what it was if I was talking about people because now the marbles are all identical. So, now I even here I can find the entropy which would be the logarithm of the number of ways of rearranging these marbles consistent with these uh, examples. So, I am going to stop here and uh, in the next class we will continue and uh, see what entropy uh, is and if entropy is really a measure of disorder or not. Okay, thank you.